Hello, friends, and welcome to the Lectionary Call-In Podcast, a ministry of the Palmasia Presbyterian Church in Tampa, Florida. This call-in podcast uh, takes a look and seeks to be faithful to uh, the lectionary gospel reading in the Sunday coming. And so we will be looking at the lectionary reading for the first, fourth Sunday in Lent, year B, as we approach Sunday, March the 10th, uh, 2024. I'm Nicole Parton Abdenor, and today I am joined by Sarah Mickelson in Tampa. Bill Hall, St. Petersburg, Florida. I am moderating this conversation this morning. And so I sent earlier this week, uh, or la later last week, rather, uh, my friends three questions uh, that we have each considered and are prepared to discuss this morning. The gospel reading for today uh, comes from the Gospel of John. We're in our second week uh, of the Gospel of John. We're in chapter three, verses 14 to 21. A little bit of context, though, um, if I may, before reading the text for uh, this morning, uh, because today the, the lectionary does one of its weird things uh, that always puzzles me, which is sort of in, we, we get dropped in sort of midstream or mid story rather in this case. Um, so what's going on in the third chapter of John's gospel is that Jesus has an encounter with a man by the name of Nicodemus, um, which is likely a familiar story to many of us. Uh, just as a reminder, Nicodemus is a man, a learned man, a man of learning. The text describes him as a ruler of the Jews and a teacher of Israel. And uh, Jesus and Nicodemus uh, end up in a, a, a deep and an engaging conversation with one another, uh, in which it really seems as though uh, they are talking uh, in some ways sort of past each other. It's, again, another example of folks simply not co fully comprehending what Jesus is trying to say. And they particularly are engaged in a conversation around uh, the flesh and the spirit. Oh, and that was not the spirit. That was my 60 pound Labrador. Okay. <laughs> so with that, let us turn to the reading of God's word. And we begin uh, with verse 14 of John chapter three. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the son of man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the son into the world to condemn the world but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light, and do not come to the light, so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be Thank to God. You. So as we begin this conversation, our first question, why the comparison of the Son of Man being lifted up to the serpent on the pole? What are we to take away by looking at this image? Sarah? You know, I... um. I'm often enchanted by the comments that people make on some of the um, commentaries, the biblical commentaries that I look at each week. And, and sometimes there's just nuggets of gold right there. Somebody has come up with a really valuable or very um, cherished idea. And this week's comes from uh, Pastor Russell Meyer and a comment on Mark Davis's blog about this particular passage, he writes, the truth is Jesus disarms the punishment that the empire terrorizes with. And I thought about how do you turn fear inside out and make it a blessing? And, and 
and what a terrible story to to consider um but this also reminded me of the numbers 21 passage 4 through 9 where um that's the reference to Moses lifting up the serpent in the in the wilderness and um so to be lifted up to physically on a cross, to be seen by all of those whose sin becomes a reminder of that particular sacrifice or that moment of, of excruciating suffering. Um, it's an interesting moment to transition that sacrifice into grace. Um, and I think it's a recognition of what is given, and we get to see that over and over again, um, so that we might live. And so, I'm, I'm. This is a transformational moment, I think, in in the in the eyes of a of a follower of Christ. A symbol of sacrifice for the care of others, and it made me think about um, the symbol of of medicine, which is a caduceus, which has two snakes intertwined on um, a staff. And um, I thought about that. It's a kind of an inoculation against death or a vaccine for sin. Um, there are a number of, of musical references in this particular realm, a remedy to the sickness and se of the separation from God. Um, so at the same time, it's a vivid reminder of how much we are loved. Mark Davis adds, here's my sentiment about this story from Numbers 21, 4 through 9. The people are cursed by God because they refuse to accept God's provision. And they complained about the miserable food called manna. The snakes were the punishment. And to be saved from the snakes, they had to look at the bronze serpent. And they had to reckon with their refusal to accept God's provision. There's a coarse frankness in looking at one sin in order to be saved from it. So those are my thoughts about being lifted up. Um, I, again, I think it's uh, turning a fear of, of something dire and punishment inside out and making it um, a moment of grace. So that's what I got. Thanks, Sarah. I appreciate, I appreciate those reflections and the lifting up of the, of a medical symbol I hadn't that hadn't occurred to me, but that's really I think is profound and interesting. It, it makes me wonder the um, <clears throat> the origin of that symbol for the medical field, and if it if it, if in fact it does have biblical roots. Bill, uh, yes, also Sarah, thank you for that reminder. Um, I will begin by noting that this narrative is only in John among the four Gospels. Uh, there's consensus that John was the last written of the four we have. So a whole other discussion would be, why does John, having been aware of the other writings, choose to remember uh, this? Uh, I, it's a, a powerful narrative, and one of your later questions will get us to a particular verse in this narrative, Nicole, that uh, is very powerful even today. Um, it was interesting to me, you, when you ask your question, it occurred to me the image of a serpent occur, occurs various times in Scripture. Among them, first of all, in Genesis 3 in the Garden of Eden, the, the serpent is the, the one who tempts uh, Adam and Eve. But then in um, Exodus 7, Moses at the burning bush, God instructs Moses. Moses is saying, why would people believe me? Mo Moses had murdered an Egyptian, fled, married a foreign woman, was living in isolation and hiding, and God comes to him in burning bush. And understandably, Moses says, why would anybody believe me? And God says, that rod in your hand, throw it on the ground. It turned into a serpent. Later, in the presence of Pharaoh, Aaron, the brother of Moses, also threw a rod down and it became a serpent. And then, interestingly, in Matthew 10, Jesus calls us to be wise as serpents. So even the image of a serpent in Scripture is a symbol of evil or death, but 
there's a wisdom even in uh, this symbol of, of evil. Uh, I just found that, uh, and there are other references. Therefore, Nicole, it seems to me the serpent is a symbol both of danger and protection. And throughout my comments, uh, whether I use the words or not, the theme for me this week is the, the paradox. You know, here's the, you this thing that can bite you and kill you is also, if you look at it, uh, a, a source of healing. And that theme of paradox and mystery, I think, runs throughout this uh, passage and, in fact, is at the heart of the gospel. Therefore, the cross, of course, represents Jesus' death and suffering, the ultimate evil, but it was also how we came to be forgiven. And Caroline Lewis this week on the Working Preacher blog, for me, helpfully reminded us that Jesus is lifted up three times, crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension. And she strongly urges us, anytime we talk about this passage, to remember that broader context, death, new life, uh, ascension. And a, a further part of the paradox, the snake is both the pain and the cure. And how can the source of pain also be the source of healing is a question asked by Amy Vaughn in a upper room uh, meditation this week. How can the source of pain also be the source of healing? And recently we reflected on Jesus as calling us to deny ourselves, take up our cross, lose our lives for his sake. And that was in the context of Jesus announcing his own suffering. So we are in some way to sacrifice and even to suffer yet in those choices, God offers us a new life, robust, abundant, lived in service to God and to others, especially those on the margin. And then I will conclude with this quote from the Connections Lectionary Commentary, John Coulter, who wrote, John's gospel presents Jesus in the double role above Moses and the bronze serpent, like Moses, Jesus serves as an intermediary between God and the people. And like the servant, Jesus provides the means by which human beings are able to overcome that which threatens them. So it seems to me the ultimate message is the image of the servant reminds us of the power of God, even in the face of evil, to work for good. Thank you, friends. Uh, the, uh, there's a lot of depth <laughs> isn't there to this. And and it's like once you once you start digging, you keep uncovering more and more. And as you said, Bill, I mean, you that, that those are just a few of the examples that that serpents appear in scripture and are lifted up. Um, so it's a it is a powerful and a profound image. I think we do well to to pause and to to consider reflectively. And so often, I think because of the depth of this larger story, we sort of jump over that detail quite often. Uh, we end up as teachers and preachers going towards other images and other phrases within the text. But but this this one phrase and one image is certainly worthy of our of our consideration. I think I would just add um, to to what has been added that, you know, I'm mindful that uh, in John's gospel up until this point that the disciples really keep resisting, as we've heard, and pushing against Jesus's talk about his suffering and the death uh, that he's going to come to. And um and they keep asking for symbols and for signs. And so in this, he is lifting up a symbol and a sign for them that they are familiar with, that they do embrace. Um, and they lift up this symbol of the snake, which as it's already been lifted, uh, 
has been and was a, often a symbol of death, but that for the Israelites through Moses, that they were encouraged that should they have trust and belief in God when they look at that bronze uh, serpent on the staff, that indeed it, it will not bring them death, uh, but bring them life. And so there's an encouragement for us here, as you all have so eloquently um, put it, uh, to 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 know and to begin to see that God is one who is able to bring life, um, even even through things that on the face of it, um, bring us suffering and bring us death. So uh, let's not just, let's not just jump over this um, serpent, but let's pause and consider it even in the great riches of the text, but there are other riches in this text. And so I'm going to move us along to our second question. It seems that we so often use this text uh, to limit God's power and to make a distinction of who is an insider and who is an outsider. And Paul Shoup, reflecting on this text, asks us to consider, what if instead of limiting God's love to the insiders, the believers who walk in the light, a prophetic voice was being raised to imagine a world in which God's love is at work yet again among the oppressed, the outsiders. Bill, are you able to comment and reflect on this? Yes, a, a tough question. For me, Nicole, the heart of your question is reflected in verses 17 and 18, which say, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in, it, in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. Here again, there's a confounding paradox. I am much more comfortable with verse 17 than 18, just to be honest. And yet, if we're going to listen to the plain text, uh, both verses are here, and not only here, but juxtaposed right next to each other. So it reminds us that God's intent is to save the world, that every knee should bow and every tongue confess. I, I'm, I'm more comfortable there by nature, uh, and that's the spirit in which I've attempted to live out my faith and ministry, leaving the judgment to God and simply seeking, seeking to represent the grace of God. Um, but verse 18 is here. And it, to me, says that there is great assurance, but there are also boundaries and consequences. And uh, I don't know how to balance them. I'm clear though two verses are in a tension with each other, at least inside of me. And so yet again, the good news of Jesus Christ confronts us with a seeming paradox of mystery. Bill, your, um, your response has me thinking about <clears throat> kind of the phrase and the, this is something that's been, I've seen in, art and, you know, kind of different images and it's be the light, be the light. And I think that, you know, for me, that's, that's where within this question that I sort of, I dwell and find my call and my commission that Jesus is the light. And as that, and as a follower and as a believer, I'm not called into the role, um, to, to be that judge, that, that rightfully belongs to God as you lift it up, Bill. But I am called to, to be the light in the ways in which I'm able to. And, and light amplifies light. And, and part of that work then cast, begins to cast shadows and to dispel some of the darkness. And, you know, it, it's not for us to worry about kind of the labels that we so often gravitate towards and want to place both around God and around one another. We really are to simply continue to walk and to follow uh, Jesus and to do the work that we are called to do. 
and 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 God's gonna God's gonna sort it out. And just like with the image of the serpent, right? The the things that seem to bring about death and that seem to have such finality for God, that's simply not true. Um, God's able to continue to work and push against those finite boundaries that we so often place and we are, are beyond our imagination. Um, which is an, which is just interesting and, and mind boggling. Sarah. You know, I, I love this idea of the spirit continually moving love through the hearts and minds and lives of those that are not yet in the light, perpetually nudging them toward the light. Um, I, that's a really comforting image to me. That's an assuring image to me. Um, it, you know, it makes me go, am I being nudged? And in what way? Um, are we light bearers is the question that came to my mind. And if we are, how do we as light bearers move toward those who are in the dark or those that are being called back to the dark? Um, you know, I, I'm reminded on a regular basis that perhaps the sheepdog image is valuable here that the sheepdog continually moves the flock toward the shepherd. Um, not with judgment, but simply a presence that's coming alongside and standing with against the encroaching dark. Um, and, and do we raise our heads and smile when somebody new shows up? Um, this idea that, uh, you know, uh, there's a, a couple of Facebook post passages that are floating around that talk about the difference between how people are greeted when they come into a 12 step meeting and how people are greeted when they come into church. And the, the implication being when you come into the 12 step meeting, people are super glad to see you because they realize um, that you made a decision to, to come and that in doing so it's a life saving choice. And do we feel that way about people who would come to church? And and so that kind of stops me in my tracks a little bit. And do, how do we respond? Do we do we acknowledge how they're dressed? Do we see what they you know the disposition of their face, or are we just glad to see them? And and how valuable and how um, comforting it is to be received with a great big smile, with a certain sense of wow, I'm glad to meet you. I'm glad you're here. Um, you know what you have to offer is what we need. So that sense of, of how do we stand as light bearers um, with, you know, a lamp. If, you know, I'm thinking of there's so much music that's tied to this. Give me oil in my lamp, keep it burning. Um, Mary, bring a lamp, you know, set the lamp up high. There's a whole lot of conversation around that and, and how valuable it is to be able to see from a distance. Um, you know, the benefit of seeing a light, a lighthouse. I'm thinking of all those metaphors that are out there for us. Um, and and the, that it feels a whole lot better when you're moving toward the light than when you're trying to discern what's in the dark. Um, so that is helpful to me. So that's my reflection and comment on that question. Um, I don't know if I actually answered the question, but um, for me, that's how it, it works in, in my thinking. Thank you, friends. Thank you. That brings us to our third and final question. <clears throat> and it alludes to what uh, Bill alluded to a little bit earlier. This uh, passage often gets just boiled down to one verse. <clears throat> um, and it's confined to a bumper sticker or a poster board, often at sporting events. Uh, where it might just say John 3, 16, which is for God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Uh, if you were to make a bumper sticker from this larger text, what would it be and why? Sarah, I'm coming to you first. Okay, so walk with me down this silly path. Um, there's this moment in The Wizard of Oz when the four of them have come out of the poppy field and are seeing the city of Oz for the first time. And there's this wonderful tight harmony given to us by 
a group of singers that basically goes, come out of the dark, step into the light. And I thought that's um, a sweet remembrance of this. Um, so I have one thumper sticker that says, come out of the dark, step into the light. And I'm really paraphrasing. It's a much longer song. And then um, I left the light on for you. God, we see, I've seen that one before and I like that a lot. Um, there's a take hope and find your light. And, and that for me is a reference to in theater. One of the things they teach you to do is feel the weight of the light on your face so that, you know, when you're standing in full vision for the audience. So they'll put a spotlight on and you have to stand and you have to walk toward that light and then find where the center is. And, and that's how you know when to deliver or start to deliver your story or your monologue or whatever it is you're doing. And it's, it's a lesson of what it feels like to have a full light on your face. So it's take hope and find your light. And then the last one is a harken back to a milk campaign. It's got light? Question mark. And, and th those are my four offerings for bumper stickers based on this text. I love it. You may have missed your calling in life, Sarah. <laughs> I think that you have some potential here. <laughs> you start an Etsy shop. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Bill, how about you? Well, it's interesting that I follow <laughs> Sarah, who did a great job, because when I first read this question, Nicole, I thought, Maybe for the first time in my years of knowing Nicole Abdenour, I may need to ask uh, her uh, to forgive herself for putting, revealing one of my weaknesses. A quick story. Years ago, serving as a pastor at Sefner Presbyterian Church, this particular young family wanted to join the church. Given their schedule, I could only visit them on Sunday afternoon. So the father and I sat at the pool watching the kids and his wife. And he had heard the sermon that morning, and he was complimentary. And in the course of the conversation, I said, I, I never, almost never feel good about my sermon titles. I want them somehow to be memorable and to reflect the message, and I just don't think I do a good job of it. He said, I, I hear you. Let me tell you my the sermon title I will never forget. We were on vacation. We went to this strange church. The pastor was preaching on the burning bush, and the title of the sermon was, Who Me? Question mark. Yes, you! Exclamation point. I said, that's an example of what I aspire to. So there's no way I can come up to a level of creativity. Uh, to take a few shots at bumper stickers, uh, in the Christian century, Carrington Heath says, we live in a soundbite culture. The message has to fit the billboard or the mm -hmm. T-shirt or the five-second preview of the news. But the thing about slogans and sound bites is we grow weary of them. We do not believe them for very long, especially if they do not generate real action and the people who hear them finally become disillusioned then move on to something else. Now, Sarah's bumper stickers do not fit that description. They are excellent. Um, but um, to demonstrate my lack of prowess, I will offer you a, come, a couple I came up with. And again, I said earlier, for me, the theme that runs throughout this is the sense of mystery and paradox. So one was risk and danger, illness and healing, hyphen, a paradox, a unity. That's rather philosophical. And the uh, similar, Jesus Christ, hyphen, a challenge, a promise. Um, however we want to phrase it, Jesus Christ is good news that invites, comforts, confronts, stretches, unsettles, and empowers us to live in God's light and to work to bring the kingdom of God on earth. And I will close with a hymn years ago, a music director introduced me to, and I love the third verse that picks up on this theme of paradox and mystery. 
in our end is our beginning, in our time infinity, in our doubt there is believing, in our life eternity, in our death a resurrection, at last, at last a victory, titled Hymn of Promise. Thank you. Well, Bill and Sarah, you both um, have been around me long enough to know that um, I just simply outright uh, resist and most of the time refuse to title my sermons. <laughs> After I left seminary, I thought nobody can make me have to title something um, because there's nothing more intimidating for me uh, than to have to do to title something. It's, to me, a title comes last. It can't come first. And um, so you know, in order to go to print, there's, there's no way I can title a sermon. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm with you there, Bill. I am absolutely with you there. But I, you know, as I was thinking about that, I, I often wonder <clears throat> why the, why, why John three sixteen out of all of these verses, uh, because I, I much more gravitate towards, you know, even 17 and 18, like you were reflecting on Bill earlier. Um, and, and if I can be so bold as to say, I would like to go back and I would like to edit, uh, the gospel of John because I, <laughs> so that, oh, I could, I can take certain, ver certain clauses from those three verses to form one statement. Um, it would be God so loved the world. He sent his son not to condemn the world, but the world might be saved through him. And I, I wonder if then we can't, um, if we'd be able to then resist doing some damage. <laughs> um, because I think a lot of, a lot of, a lot of hurt, um, and, and a lot of uh, judgment comes out of John three sixteen. when I, that's not, that's not the purpose of it. That's not the intention. I don't believe of the author. It's the lead phrase of, for God so loved the world. Um, and yet, um, so often I think when it gets flashed up, it's as a, as a fear tactic, um, rather than a welcoming invitation, um, and, a lifting up of the power, um, and the grace of God's love, which is so great. Um, so if it was just to be two words, like God loves the world, right? I mean, period. God, or exclamation mark, rather, God loves the world. God loves you. Um, that's the that's the that's the sound bite and the takeaway. Uh, I think of this of this text, and and the the gospel writers continue to to lift up that point. And even when we don't get it <laughs> through this text and through other texts, they continue to find ways to show us um, the depth of of God's love. So thank you, friends, for um, this great conversation this morning around these important words. Uh, are there any final thoughts as we draw our time to a close? I will share this briefly. My favorite book of the Bible is the book of James, which means do your faith. My favorite two parables of Jesus are the sower and the wheat and tares. The sower says, throw it just indiscriminately offer the love of God and leave judgment. Don't leave judgment to God. Don't appoint yourself as a weed puller. Leave it alone. God will sort it out. So that I embrace that because that's what I wanted and want to be the style of my life and ministry. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. All right, friend. Oh, Sarah, were you getting ready to say something? Sorry. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, uh, viewers, for joining us today and being a part of this conversation. If you would like to learn more about the ministry uh, and work of Palmasia Presbyterian Church, we invite you to uh, check out our website, www.palmasia.org. Or if you're ever in Tampa, Florida, to come on by and worship with us and to join us for a class in person. Uh, until next time, may the peace of Christ be with you.